Hello, new prospect. Welcome to RTB 2021 for May the 31st, 2021. Hope you're doing well on this last day of May, also Memorial Day. We we'll want to uh, express our thankfulness uh, on Memorial Day for those who gave the ultimate sacrifice to, uh, to gain our freedoms as a country. We're very thankful to live in a country that we do, uh, despite all the problems that we have. Uh, we have a great country and uh, many have sacrificed to make it great. And so thankful for them. Also, May the 31st is a pretty special day in the crib household. Uh, this is our uh, 18th wedding anniversary. So uh, happy anniversary to my uh, beautiful bride, Elizabeth. Very thankful for her and uh, just for her ministry to me and, and our family and to, to our church as well. Uh, she's just a wonderful uh, a gift and uh, just uh, grateful for the last 18 years that God has given us and looking forward to uh, many more. Uh, after this. So um, let's dive right, right into our text. Uh, we have some some pretty significant texts for us today. We've got Deuteronomy chapter 4, Psalm 86 and 87, uh, Isaiah 32, and then Revelation 2. By the way, if you hear some uh, some talking outside my office, it's uh, we've got some classes going on this summer. So hopefully that won't be too distracting for you. But let's dive right into Isaiah uh, 32. We'll start with Isaiah uh, and then we'll close with uh, Psalm and then Deuteronomy and then uh, Revelation. So let's uh, jump into Isaiah 30, 32. So we're in the midst of, right in the heart of this section of Isaiah 28 through 35, where we had this collection of six woe art articles. If you remember, uh, we've talked about those the past few days, uh, where we have these introductions uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the individual chapters uh, with an, an exhortation of woe. Um, and this is a chapter where we don't have that. And, uh, these oracles, uh, of judgment are interrupted here, uh, by a vision of a future calm, a future, uh, reign of a, of a righteous king. We see that in verse one, the king will reign righteously and the princes will rule justly. Well, why is that so significant? Well, if you read down to the end of the of the chapter, you'll see this this beautiful vision of, of peace uh, and justice and righteousness being in the land. Of course, these are the very key characteristics of being uh, a covenant people of God. This is what they should be exhibiting because this is the very character of God himself. They're being righteous even as God is righteous. They're being just even as God is just. And God has called his people to be just and righteousness in the land. And so um, uh, when that happens, there will be peace. There will be a right covenant relationship between God and his people. Uh, and this will result in covenant blessings of which one of the primary uh, qualities of is, is, uh, is, is ultimately uh, peace with God himself. Uh, but what will be the key? How will people uh, have this peace and righteousness and justice? Well, I think verse one, kind of by introducing this to total chapter, uh, gives us the key to that. It's when the king reigns righteously. It's when the king reigns justly. And when he does those things, he will lead the people to do the very thing uh, that, uh, that God is requiring. And that's exactly what Jesus uh, does for us. He is the one who came, uh, as John tells us, full of, uh, full of grace and truth and full of righteousness and justice, uh, full of these qualities that God so desired in his people. And so when God sees Jesus, he, he sees us through him, or when God sees us, uh, he sees Jesus, uh, and that is, um, that's, that's the only way uh, for God's people to be restored, and so we have a hint of that in the uh, book of Isaiah in chapter 32 here. Uh, let's move on to, we'll go over to Psalm. So in the book of Psalms, uh, we have two Psalms today, 86 and 87, and I was, I was reading through Psalm 86 in particular. This is a uh, psalm of, of uh, as my text here tells us, uh, supplication and trust. It's a declaration in, of trust in God. It, it's also uh, been labeled by some, again, as a lament type of psalm because you begin with this invocation to incline your ear, O God, and answer me. Uh, we see this often throughout the psalms, and I think I've mentioned this before, that the, one of the most amazing things about our relationship with God is that God uh, is a God who hears, and uh, this idea of him uh, being so near to us that he can hear us is something that is a, a quality that the psalmist often revels in, uh, and yet uh, 
it's it's expertly done in this this particular psalm because he uses of course what we would call an anthropomorphism anthro meaning man or human and morphism being form so it's portraying god in this human form uh and god having an ear here uh and this is of course to emphasize the fact that he does in fact hear us the other thing that really struck me about this psalm and and this is something you can i, th I think even see in the english uh obviously you could see it uh, more clearly in the original languages, but you can definitely see it in the English. One of the things I did was just underline uh, through my uh, psalm here how many times the psalmist refers to God. Uh, incline your ear, O God. Uh, you answer me, for I am afflicted and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am a godly man. O you, my God, save your servant who trusts in you. Uh, be, you be gracious to me, O Lord. Uh, for to you I cry all day long. Make glad the servant of, make glad the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Uh, and you go through and you just underline all those yous. It shows how God-centered the psalmist perspective is, and how God-centered the psalm is. Uh, the 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 psalmist's uh, confidence uh, in the midst of his trial, his confidence in the midst of his suffering is based upon one one uh, thing, and that is. Uh, that there's a God uh, who is uh, who is His God, uh, and He is a God who hears. Uh, and so, by addressing all these things to to God, there He is giving this confidence uh, that God is the one who uh, who uh, does uh, hear, and He is the only God who does that. Verse ten: You alone uh, are God. Uh, there's another picture I love in the psalm where you have this uh, uh, another exhortation, another prayer. Uh, the psalmist, by the way, that's a great, another great way of reading the psalms is as prayers, because oftentimes what you'll find in the psalms are these invocations or supplications of God. Uh, they're not commands towards God, they're requests, aren't they? So if you go through, you find many of these throughout the, uh, throughout the, the psalm. Incline your ear, preserve my soul, be gracious to me. Uh, make glad my soul, uh, give ear. Uh, all these are those those supplications. But in verse eleven, we have another one of them. Trust me, tr teach me your way, O, o Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. That's an interesting invocation, isn't it? Or interesting supplication, uh, the request of God to unite his heart. It's, it, I wrote out in my margin here, I don't know when I read this previously, but I wrote out in my margin a Romans 7 type of prayer. If you remember Romans 7, we have that kind of that uh, picture of Paul as this conflicted character. And some people believe that's Paul before salvation, some people after. But regardless, it's a conflicted person, right? Uh, that our hearts can sometimes be conflicted in, in, in spiritual things. And here the psalmist is... Uh, wanting God to take all these conflicted emotions and unite them uh, specifically in fear of his name. In other words, that he, he will have a, um, an uncluttered heart when it comes to the things of God, that he will understand him uh, clearly. He'll understand who God is, understand who he himself is, and then understand how God relates to him in covenant relationship. Uh, and then that will produce within him uh, ultimately, this this uh, disposition towards God of, re of respect and fear uh, and right understanding. And so a uh, beautiful picture here and a, and a beautiful request of God himself. One that one of the things about prayers like this that we find in Psalms uh, and throughout the Bible is that these are praying in God's will, aren't they? Uh, these are things that God desires us to pray by including them in his scriptures. And so we can pray them and God will hear and and I think um, answer them in according uh, in accordance uh, to his goodness and kindness and according to his will. So that's Psalm 86. Uh, Psalm 87 is another one of the Psalms of Zion, which um, uh, of course celebrate God's presence among his people on uh, Mount Zion, which of course uh, is the place of, of the uh, of the the rule of, of God and his people in Jerusalem. And one of the things that, that strikes me again about this text is the mention of these foreign countries that will ultimately be resorting to God uh, because of uh, his restoration of his, of his people. Uh, and when God restores his people and when God 
uh, God's people are in right re relationship with him. Ultimately, what that brings is a message to the nations. And there's all throughout the Old Testament a, a vision of God uh, ultimately bringing the nations, not just bringing Israel into right relationship with him, but bringing the nations uh, to worship him as well. And we are part of that. You know, we are part of the nations that God has drawn to himself, ultimately through the work of Christ. So that's Psalm 86 and 87. Uh, let's move on to Deuteronomy 4. So Deuteronomy 4 is the last of Moses' sermon, his first sermon, his first address. Uh, and we're about to shift to the second one, which will start in verse 44 uh, of this text and move on through a good portion of the rest of Deuteronomy, depending on how you divide the book. But this is a, the last of this sermon. And this is where Moses gets to some of the exhortations. So he's rehearsed the history already in chapters two and three, and really a good portion of chapter one. And now he's moving on to making exhortations based upon that. Uh, and so he will say things like, uh, you know, hear the statutes and the judgments, um, telling them to, you know, basically through rehearsing this history to now respond to God in covenant relationship, to keep and do the, the principles of the covenant relationship that he's about to outline in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, so this is, this is all exhortative material to the people of Israel. And again, remember, this is Moses' last opportunity to do so. And so the, the passion and the urgency of this is palpable, I think, uh, as you read through it. Now, uh, one of the things I love about Deuteronomy 4, there's a couple of things. One of the things, though, is the, the, the picture of God, the theology, the true theology. Theology is just the study of God, right? The theology of God proper that we find here in this text is so rich. Uh, so we see God as this God who reveals, for instance, a God who, uh, who redeems his people. Look, look at verse 3. Your eyes have seen what the Lord has done. Uh, in the case of Baal Peor, for all the men who were following after Baal Peor, and, and the Lord destroyed them from following them, a God of justice. Um, we have uh, a God of, uh, let's see, a God of nearness, verse 7. Uh, God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call upon him. I'll touch on that again in a minute. Uh, we have a God who seeks, um, uh, I'm sorry, God, who speaks, the Lord spoke to you, verse 12, from the midst of the fire, and you heard the sound of his words. Um, you have a God who is jealous, verse 24, a consuming fire, jealous, and we talked about this uh, jealousy earlier, I think, uh, I preached on this at some point, I can't remember when, uh, but the jealousy of God, a God who is jealous for his glory, for his name, for his person, and for his people, um, and for their devotion. Uh, in fact, this, this, is, this is a title of God, El Kana, the, the God, the jealous one, um, a covenantal God uh, that is pictured here, a God who, um, who can be found, verse 29, a God who's compassionate, verse 31. Um, moving on, a God who, uh, who loves, verse 37, a God who is unique, verse 35. There's no other ones besides him. Uh, so reading through this, you have this picture of, of God that's presented here. And of course, the significant thing about this is that God is the same in, in Deuteronomy that he is in the book of Revelation. He's the same in Genesis as he is in the gospel. God doesn't change that the, the scriptures. And so when you see this picture of God as presented in Deuteronomy 4, this is something you can be confident in that he is still the same uh, yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, the other thing I want to draw your attention to is verses 7 and 8. This is a text I often will point to uh, when it comes to uh, talking about the, uh, the, the privilege that the Israelites had uh, to have the law uh, and the Torah given to them, uh, that what characterized them as a special people of God, or a special people in the world, uh, was that they uh, had a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call upon them, and has a God who has displayed that nearness by drawing them into covenant relationship and giving them a covenant document through which they can have that right covenant relationship with God. Uh, they, they honored the Torah even as a married couple might honor uh, their vows that were taken. Uh, this was something special to them. It was something that defined them as a special people. 
Um, and therefore, they would celebrate the, the Torah, the law that had been given to them. Psalm 119 is just that, right? It's a 176 verse celebration of the Torah uh, that was given to, uh, that God graciously gave to his people. All of the other nations of the ancient world were wondering, well, who were our gods? Uh, who are the gods and what are they like? And what are we, what are we supposed to, um, how are we supposed to respond to them? Uh, what have they done on our, our, our behalf? Uh, all the other ancient Near Eastern religions wondered those things, but here uh, Israel was defined by the fact that they had a God who had revealed those things to them. And again, God doesn't change. Uh, he's the same, and he has done that for us as well. That's why we celebrate things like the scriptures, because through it, uh, it shows God's nearness to us, his love for us, his concern and watch care over us, and it distinguishes us as a people. Only, uh, only believers in, in, in Christ have the true nature of God revealed to, to us uh, in, in, the, in the scriptures. And so uh, what a wonderful thing God's word uh, ultimately is. So uh, let's move on finally to Revelation chapter 2. And of course, these are beginning the, the letters uh, that um, the famous seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation. A few reminders about uh, Revelation. First of all, remember that um, it's not always going to be predictive, uh, but it always is going to be practical. Uh, so this book um, has captured the imagination of many Christians throughout the centuries, and many Christians throughout the centuries have allowed themselves to be um, to, to have their imaginations run wild when it comes to the book of Revelation. But here, uh, let me give you a quote here from, I was trying to find this from uh, the Anglican Bishop J.C. Ryle, a famous Bible commentary of the previous century. Uh, he wrote that much, to, much of the discredit which has fallen on prophetical study has arisen from the fact that many students, instead of expounding prophecy, have turned into prophets themselves. Uh, so in handling the book of Revelation, we need to be, um, we need to be careful. We don't want to lead others to think that it's too mysterious and too uh, symbolic to be understood in a meaningful way. What I want you to understand is that by uh, looking at the book of Revelation in its original context and uh, by understanding how uh, John is just painting this picture of a ruling resurrected Christ uh, through uh, the lens of the Old Testament, it's understandable and it's applicable to us today. Now, a couple of things about this, this section. Uh, I think that John is exhorting very real churches to very real practical action to encourage and to discipline them. So uh, you'll, you'll notice that some churches are, are, uh, are commended, some are not. Uh, some are, most of the churches, most of these seven churches are ones that receive both commendations and, and criticisms. Uh, so the only ones that get commendations and no criticisms are the church at Smyrna. Uh, which is in our chapter today in the church of Philadelphia in chapter three. One of the, there's only one of the churches that receives only criticism and no kind of, and commendations, no commendations at all. And that's the church of Laodicea. That's the, the last of the churches. Uh, but four of them get mixed reviews. So, so the church of Ephesus, of Pergamum, of Thyatira, and those three are in our chapter today. And then finally Sardis in chapter three. Uh, so, you know, as you read through these, I think they are all applicable uh, admonitions and commendations for us today as, as churches, as individual churches. So looking at the commendations and say, well, how can we mirror our, the life of our church based on those commendations? Looking at the criticisms and, how, and, and reflectively and honestly uh, look at ourselves and say, are we doing this and do we need to, do we need to be corrected? Um, however, the message, uh, and, and so I would say that the message is definitely, uh, not just for those original churches, it has a prophetic purpose for us today as well. And when I say prophetic, I'm talking about exhortative, right? Taking the word of God and applying it to us. Now, um, why would I say that? Why do I say that these, these, uh, letters are still applicable to us today? Well, Obviously, they're the scriptures, so they should be, uh, but I think also the number seven gives us a clue uh, that this was, uh, you know, these churches are just representative of the church as a whole. Um, these seven churches were all in Asia Minor, 
Uh, and I think I mentioned this before, they're kind of in a loop of what likely would have been the way the letters would be circulated, the mail route, I guess you could say. Uh, and so while each church is addressed individually, all seven churches are important for each church to read. Uh, and notice that each of the letters ends with, let him, he who has the ear to hear, let, this, let him hear what the Spirit says, not to the church, but to the churches, right? So this is something that is written specifically to all churches. So we need to be, New Prospect Baptist Church, let us have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Um, the other thing to notice about, of course, these letters is that the way Jesus identifies himself. Uh, every time is taken from, his self-identification is taken from some aspect of the vision uh, that he gives to John in chapter one. So that opening vision is something that uh, defines each of these letters. And each of the letters, if you look at them, also is defined uh, by uh, what, let me uh, read it specifically to you. Uh, this phrase, and the, the, to the angel of the church at Pergamon, for instance, uh, the one who has a sharp two-edged sword says this. That phrase says this. This is a prophetic formula from the Old Testament. In other words, this is a, uh, oftentimes what you would see is the prophet would utter something and then they would say, thus says the Lord. In this case, it's Jesus himself who's speaking it, right? This is not John saying, thus says Jesus. This is Jesus speaking it. And it's this prophetic feel uh, of, and again, prophecy is not just, I, I'm not using it to refer to somebody predicting the future. I'm using it referred to exhortation to bring the people that he's addressing into closer conformity to, with the will of God, to change your mindset and behavior, to bring them into right covenant relationship with God. That's the purpose of these letters. And that's the purpose of the letters for us as well today. Obviously, we could dive into uh, each of these letters. And if you remember back, um, a ways back, I actually preached on these seven letters. Uh, this was, I think, in one of my first interims at New Prospect. And um, I can't remember which one it was, but uh, we went through these individual letters and, uh, and each one uh, has some, some uh, very practical uh, and urgent even uh, messages for the church uh, today. I mean, just the, the first one of Ephesus not leaving their first love. Let me just give you a, a one comment on that is, you know, when Paul writes to them in the book of Ephesus, now keep in mind the book of Revelation is later on uh, in the first century, uh, probably somewhere 90 to 95 AD. Uh, so a long time after Paul addressed the, the Ephesian church, uh, but he actually commends them for, for uh, their love. Uh, for for God and for each other, and now they're they're deserting that love, and so kind of get a see of a, a little bit of the development of the church in a negative direction, and Jesus Himself calling that church back to what they should be. So, uh, lots to learn in these uh, chapters. If you have specific questions on this on any of the individual letters, feel free to let me know. Uh, but I hope you have a good time reading this, and uh, and and again, the purpose of prophecy is to challenge us and to exhort us. So let's allow this, the scriptures to do that on this day, May the 31st, 2021. Hope you have a great rest of the day.